Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to Viva Systems fourth quarter and full fiscal year 2021 results conference call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. We now would like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Mr. Addo Garrett, Senior Director, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, and welcome to Viva's fiscal 2021 fourth quarter and full year earnings call for the quarter and year ending January 31st, 2021. With me on today's call are Peter Gassner, our Chief Executive Officer, Paul Shawa, EBC Strategy, and Brent Bowman, our Chief Financial Officer. During the course of this conference call, we will make forward-looking statements regarding trends, our strategies, and the anticipated performance of the business. These forward-looking statements will be based on management's current views and expectations and are subject to various risks and uncertainties, including those related to the impact of COVID-19 on our business, the life science industry, and global economic conditions. Our actual results may differ materially. Please refer to the risk listed in our earnings release and the risk factors included in our most recent filing on Form 10-Q, which is available on the company's website at www.viva.com under the Investor section and on the SEC's website at www.sec.gov. Forward-looking statements made during the call are being made as of today, March 2, 2021, based on the facts available to us today. If this call is replayed or viewed after today, the information presented during the call may not contain current or accurate information. Viva disclaims any obligation to update or revise any forward-looking statements. We will provide guidance on today's call, but will not provide any further guidance or updates on our performance during the quarter unless we do so in a public forum. The guidance we will provide today is in part based on our current assumptions as to the macroeconomic environment in which we will be operating in the future, including the timing and pace of recovery from any negative effects caused by COVID-19. Such matters that are beyond our control and our assumptions may not be correct and may change rapidly. On the call, we will also discuss certain non-GAAP metrics that we believe aid in the understanding of our financial results. A reconciliation to comparable GAAP metrics can be found in today's earnings release and in the supplemental investor presentation, both of which are available on our website. A reconciliation can also be found as an exhibit to Form 8K filed with the SEC just before this call. With that, thank you for joining us, and I'll turn it over to Peter. Thank you, Atto. First, I'd like to thank our Life Sciences customers for their incredible efforts over the last year. The COVID-19 genome was only sequenced about a year ago, and we now already have safe and effective vaccines, diagnostics, and therapies. That's just amazing speed. COVID-19 was also disruptive to the healthcare systems overall, and the industry really stepped up to support doctors and patients around the world. 2020 was a transformational year for life sciences and for Viva. The scale and speed of innovation from the Viva team enabled the industry to adapt quickly and work in new ways. Thanks to the team for your outstanding execution against our important mission. Turning to our results, Viva delivered exceptional performance for the quarter and year. Total revenue was $397 million, up 27% year over year. Subscription revenue also grew 27% year-over-year, and non-GAAP operating margin was 39%. Our full fiscal year revenue was $1.46 billion, up 33% year-over-year, and subscription revenue was $1.18 billion, up 32% year-over-year. In commercial, we further extended our leadership position with commercial cloud customer growth and the development of important new products that will set us up for future growth over the long term. In Q4, we had 17 new customer wins for Core CRM and a number of international expansions with existing enterprise accounts. It was also a standout quarter for Viva CRM Engage as customers moved to paid subscriptions at the end of the 2023 period. We are pleased with the adoption of Engage and expect high attach rates with new customers as they look to digital capabilities to drive field efficiency. I'm also very pleased with the progress in Viva Data Cloud. In Q4, we released patient data for the U.S. and now have five early adopter customers. We are also previewing our data with other customers, and the feedback is encouraging. In multiple cases, we are able to identify patients and prescribers that were not available in their existing data sets. Looking ahead, we expect to have prescriber and sales data available for the U.S. by the end of the year. 
Offerings for additional countries will come over time. It's early days, but we're excited by the potential of Viva Data Cloud to help the industry in an area that's been stagnant for too long. Having great data, software, and business consulting is allowing us to build deeper partnerships with the industry. We're starting to see increasing interest among biotechs to go all in with Viva, partnering with us from the very start to define and operationalize a digital-first commercial strategy. In Q4, we had a second biotech in the U.S. go all in with us in this way. To put the breadth of our full offering in context, Core CRM is roughly 20% of the opportunity when a customer goes all in with commercial cloud in the U.S. There is a major long-term potential for Viva in commercial if we execute well on our vision. This year, our focus is to continue to innovate in our products and optimize our delivery and support for this approach by partnering deeply with a handful of early adopters. As we look back on the year, I'd also like to share that the two acquisitions we made about 18 months ago, CrossX and Physicians World, are integrated and operating well. We further invested in CrossX, growing the team by more than 50% since acquisition. The growth is mostly in the data science area as we expand the CrossX data platform. Our event services business, that was Physicians World, made a quick pivot when the pandemic hit and has been helping lead the industry in digital events. We expect these new businesses to continue to thrive, growing roughly in line with Viva overall in the year ahead. On the R&D side, we had another great quarter across the board with wins and go lives in clinical, quality, regulatory, and safety. The industry is starting to really appreciate the power of Vault Development Cloud to streamline drug development end-to-end. -end. We closed the year with more than 850 Vault customers overall. Quality and regulatory had a record number of wins in the year. The Vault RIM and Vault Quality Suites are adding significant value to the industry as they are the only offerings that can truly unify these important functions. It was also a big year for clinical. One major milestone was in Vault CDMS. In 2016, we set out to build a better EDC, the first product in CDMS, and we believe we are now there. Vault EDC allows customers to build and execute studies more quickly than before and get access to crucial trial data faster. The impact on our customers' trial speed and agility has been significant, and the industry is starting to take notice. In fact, we just announced that six of the top seven CROs have joined the Vault CDMS partner program, which is further validation of the strength of Vault CDMS. Having a critical mass of CRO partners will make it easier for smaller customers to use Vault CDMS because they often leverage the technology provided by their CRO partner. We've also made excellent progress with Viva Clinical Network to connect sites, patients, and sponsors. This is a bold vision for the industry that over time has the potential to make trials 25% faster at 25% less cost. It's still early days for clinical network, but we have the key building blocks in place. We have seven customers signed up and the first few customers just went live with their first site on SiteConnect, which is our first clinical network application. SiteConnect links sponsors and the clinical research sites together to make study startup and study execution faster and more compliant. MyViva for Patients is another important part of the clinical network. The first application in MyViva for Patients is eConsent, and we're already working with a few early adopters. In fact, we had our very first patient use MyViva to sign an electronic consent form last Friday. That's a big milestone for Clinical Network. We're really excited about having patients use Viva applications directly. Overall, it's been great to see so much progress, innovation, and exceptional execution across the board in commercial and R&D. Looking outside of life sciences, we had another solid quarter with new customer wins and expansions in consumer goods and chemicals. In Q4, a top 20 nutrition company selected regulatory one. Despite COVID-related disruption and a significant downturn in the cosmetics industry, we had a good year overall outside of life sciences with revenue over $30 million as expected. 
Before we close, I wanted to share that in February, Viva officially became a public benefit corporation. Our proposal passed by an overwhelming majority vote. Thank you to our shareholders for your support in this important decision. This move was about the future of Viva over the decades to come and ensuring the company continues to operate in consideration of all stakeholders. But we are also seeing a positive effect right now in attracting talent to Viva and in deepening our customer relationships. I also posted a Medium article with my personal perspective on the importance of public benefit corporations more broadly. In all, it was a year of exceptional innovation and execution across the board. We're in a stronger position than ever with the right team, customers, products, and vision to fuel our growth to 2025 and beyond. I'll now turn it over to Brent to discuss the details of our financial performance. Thanks, Peter. The fourth quarter was a great close to another year of outstanding execution for Viva. We had record bookings in the quarter, driven by our continued momentum across our Development Cloud product suites and Viva CRM Engage. Development Cloud performed extremely well with a record bookings quarter, including particular strength in CTMS and QMS. In Commercial Cloud, core CRM and add-on products drove our bookings performance in the quarter. Engage conversions were extremely strong, and we believe captured roughly 60% of the total dollar opportunity. This will be a tailwind to our fiscal year 22 commercial cloud subscription revenue. We expect engaged subscription revenue growth after fiscal year 22 will be similar to other CRM add-ons. Crossix had a strong bookings quarter and posted 79 million in subscription revenue for the year. Total revenue for Crossix and Physicians World was 103 million, with Physicians World benefiting from growth in virtual events in the second half of the year. These acquired businesses are fully integrated into our financial results and will not break them out in the future. Strong subscription bookings, including engaged strength and services demand led to calculated billings of 688 million, which was 48 million above guidance. Total billings includes 15 million from changes in billing terms at a few large customers, which was 5 million above our previous expectation for Q4. Our revenue retention rate for the year was 124%. This metric is defined in the earnings release and reflects annualized subscription revenue growth within existing customers. Net of revenue attrition and continues to illustrate the increasing value we are providing to our customers and the industries we serve. We had another strong quarter of hiring. We ended the quarter with 4,506 employees, a net gain of 202 from the previous quarter. For the year, we added more than 1,000 net new employees, the vast majority of which were in our field and product development teams. Fourth quarter operating margin was 38.6%, which exceeded guidance. Operating margin was driven by subscription revenue outperformance and a smaller than expected seasonal dip in our professional services business. As a reminder, our operating margin includes roughly a 250 basis point benefit from cost savings related to lower travel and event expenses, which was in line with the previous quarter. Operating cash flow for fiscal year 21, excluding the excess tax benefit, was $471 million, which was below our guidance. Approximately $30 million of expected Q4 collections pushed to Q1 and were collected in the quarter. I'll now provide guidance for the first quarter in fiscal year 22. For Q1, we expect total revenue between 408 and 410 million with subscription revenue of roughly 330 million. We expect non-GAAP operating income for the first quarter between 157 and 159 million. This includes a benefit from reduced travel and events similar to the past three quarters. Note that we have made some changes to our fiscal year 22 sales compensation plan as we do from time to time. These changes will result in approximately $3 million in incremental expense in Q1 and approximately $11 million for the full year. Q1 non-GAAP EPS is projected to be $0.77 to $0.78 cents based on a diluted share count of approximately $162 million. Please note that we are maintaining our non-GAAP tax rate at 21% for fiscal year 22 
and will monitor this assumption for significant events, including any relevant tax law changes. We expect calculated billings of roughly $392 million in Q1, which implies year-over-year -year growth of about 17%. This reflects approximately $4 million of billings that moved into Q4 from Q1 related to the changes in billing terms we mentioned earlier. If we account for this dynamic, our normalized Q1 billings growth would be closer to 19%. Please remember that there are numerous factors that make year-over-year -year comparisons of this metric highly variable on a quarterly basis. Therefore, we do not believe quarterly billings growth is a good indicator of the underlying momentum of our business, and we do not manage to it internally. Our subscription revenue guidance and calculated billings guidance for the full year are better indicators of our momentum. Turning to our guidance for the full fiscal year 22, we expect total revenue of $1,755,000,000 to $1,765,000,000, a $45 million increase to the high end of our prior guidance. We expect subscription revenue of approximately $1,430,000,000 consisting of vault subscription revenue of roughly $750 million and commercial cloud of roughly $680 million. We expect non-GAAP operating income of about $655 million. Investing for growth is a priority for the year. Our guidance reflects investments with new data suppliers for our data cloud products and additional hiring primarily in our field and product development teams. We expect travel and event-related expenses to start to increase in the back half of the year. We expect calculated billings of approximately $1,870,000,000, which reflects a 17% year-over-year growth rate. If we adjust for changes in customer billing terms in fiscal year 21, which totaled approximately $17 million, our guidance would imply normalized billings growth of roughly 18%. We expect about 42% of full-year billings to be in Q4. We expect non-GAAP EPS for the full year of approximately $3.20 based on a fully diluted share count of approximately $163 million. Finally, we expect full-year cash flow from operations, excluding the excess tax benefit of about $635 million. In closing, I'm very happy with our strong momentum exiting the fourth quarter and the growth we expect in the coming year. We are well positioned to achieve our 2025 target of $3 billion in revenue. Thanks for joining us today, and now I'll turn it over to the operator for questions. Thank you. And as a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you wish to withdraw a question, press the pound key. We ask that you please limit yourselves to one question and one follow-up. Your first question will be from Ken Wong of Guggenheim. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, thanks for taking my question, and, and fantastic quarter, guys. Um, this one's for you, Peter. Uh, so can you maybe give us a little bit of feedback from what you're hearing from customers on this transition to a PBC? And then perhaps more importantly, you've been, you've been pretty public with your call to arms for other industry leaders to follow your lead. What kind of feedback are you getting from other executives, you know, within life sciences and perhaps even outside on this potential change to a public uh, benefit corporation? Uh, Ken, uh, thanks for the excellent question. For customers, it's, it's helping. It is, it's, a, it's a discussion starter, and it also is a very concrete way to say what Viva is all about, not just because we're saying it, but because we wrote it in our charter that we're committed to the industry, to society, and to our employees, not just to our shareholders, so they can depend on Viva long term, and it and it's absolutely helping. It's also helping in recruiting. We have people, a number of people seeking us out, and they want to they want to be um, part of that. So uh, I would say there's an unexpected also thing that that's happening. I think it's helping us generate new ideas. It's exposing us to a different ecosystem of ideas that will uh, be positive for Viva in the long term. In terms of other companies, certainly I've had a reach out from others and they're they're interested in it. I think rightfully so. This is a board decision, the PBC matter. So this is something that plays out over over years, really. This is not a snap decision, and um, it may be other right for other companies to be PBCs, and and it may not be right for them. So I try to stay neutral on that and just provide whatever 
uh, advice and, and guidance I can about how, how it fits for Viva. Got it. Fantastic. Th th thanks for the color there. Uh, and, and if it makes you feel better, we, we've been hearing it from investors that it's a positive and also have had other companies that we follow actually reach out to get some color on kind of what you guys are doing and what, what that could potentially entail from a benefit perspective. Uh, and then this, Excellent. Uh, so this follow-up for, for Brent, um, just wanted to touch on the commercial cloud growth. Uh, I think you called out $680 million. It looks like that's kind of a mid-teens growth rate. I think a lot of us were expecting a bit of a decel there with, uh, with you guys highlighting a potential cut in pharma sales reps last quarter. Uh, can you maybe walk us through one of, some of the assumptions that are in there, and is there any seasonality we should be aware of to the extent that there are going to be some reductions in, in sales reps and how that might feather into, into Outlook? So why don't, why don't I take the, the first part about the headcount reductions, and then I'll, I'll let Brent uh, answer the question about, uh, about billings and impact on the financials. Uh, so from a, from a headcount perspective, you, you know, we first talked about that last quarter. Uh, so we, we know a little bit more now. We, we said we believed it was about a 10% reduction. That will happen about uh, over the next year or so. Uh, we still think that's going to happen. We think it will happen likely over the next one to two years. Um, but, you know, so far we haven't seen the reductions happen broadly across the industry. There haven't been industry-wide reductions that we've seen in, the, in, in Q4. There's always ups and downs, just a little bit up and a little bit down as, as companies shift. Uh, but there, there have, has not yet been anything that's been uh, unusual or out of the ordinary. Now, having said that, why do we still believe it's going to happen? Uh, the, the context is important here. The, the industry has moved to digital. We have, we've helped the industry become more digital. You heard that in, in Brent's prepared remarks where we have now about 60% of market share uh, from an engaged standpoint. The, the industry is using that. That will make the industry more efficient. It will make them more effective and productive. They now have the opportunity to apply those efficiency gains uh, to either reach more customers or to have reductions in the field force. And I think pharma uh, is is thinking about you know what's how do they optimize for that, and that takes time. So uh, we haven't seen the impact yet, but I do think that will will play out. And we have included uh, those reductions in that thinking within our within our guidance as well. Yeah, and maybe I could add then in the in the 13 percent growth that that we guided to, we did see broad strength across the portfolio. So um, cross six, uh, core CRM and core CRM add-ons, um, we did have a pop in engage. So that's probably the one item that would you know it, it flowed through our Q4 billings, and you'll see that uh, flow through revenue through fiscal year 22, and then uh, beyond that, we expect uh, Engage to grow more in line with other traditional add-ons. Great. Thanks for coming, guys. Anyone? Next question will come from the line of Brian Peterson of Raymond James. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks, everyone, for taking the question. I, I kind of wanted to follow up on that just to, just to clarify. So, so Engage, how do you think about the long-term penetration potential of that? I think I just heard 60% market share. Is that of the total reps? Is that penetration? I just want to make sure I understand the, the stats that, I'm, that, that you're giving and, and maybe what is the longer-term kind of penetration potential that you see of, of that offering? Yeah, so you're, you're right. It's, it's the 60% the is the, of the total engage opportunity. So as we think, it's not as a, you know, as a percentage of the, the CRM seats that we have. It's of the total market. Uh, for for engage, uh, so you know that happened um, you know relatively quickly over the course of the last year. We we um, you know we were there for the industry with the right products and, and technology and expertise to move the industry quickly. Um, you know we'll see that impact hit our revenue as Brent mentioned um, largely this fiscal year, and then beyond that, you know we'll see it grow more like a, a, a steady growing add-on. Uh, so most of the pop that we have seen has, has already hit in, the, in this current year. And then beyond that, uh, I think it will see steady growth. And it may approach, you know, some of the similar attach rate to, um, to what we've talked about with close of marketing and with approved email, uh, which are um, a bit higher than where we're at with 60%. Okay, thanks for the clarification. And I just wanted to hit on on the 17 new wins for the core CRM. You know, obviously, uh, you know, you guys have a, a pretty – significant market share leadership position there. I'd just be curious if you had to take a step back 
and think about the results for the core CRM this year. How did that perform versus your expectations? And any thoughts on competitive dynamics in that space? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I, I can cover that also. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. I mean, last, last quarter we had 19 uh, CRM wins. That was a record. Uh, this quarter we had 17 CRM wins. Uh, you know, as we look across those, there are, uh, many of them are pre-commercial companies, a lot of them in the U.S. market. Uh, we, we are also seeing, um, you know, wins in Europe. But then even in some of the uh, domestic markets, like in Brazil and in Japan. Uh, so uh, we're, we're pleased with that. We're winning most deals. In terms of, you know, the overall competitive landscape, uh, you know, we're gaining share. Uh, we've gained share quarter over quarter. We've gained share year over year. And, you know, there's a reason for that. The reason we're gaining share is because, you know, particularly in really difficult times like we're operating in, uh, you know, companies are looking for a partner they can trust. They want a partner that can execute. This is all about execution, right? You have field people that need to be productive in the field. They need a partner that they can trust. They also want a partner that can innovate with them, and we've proven that. And they're also looking for somebody who has the domain expertise and the guidance to get them through to digital transformation. And that's what we've been doing over the last year. So uh, from a competitive standpoint, uh, our position has actually improved over the last year because it's really shined a, a light on the difference between how Viva is operating and how rest of the you know, others, other alternatives in the market um, appear. So uh, really happy with, uh, with progress from a competitive standpoint. Good to hear. Congrats on the strong quarter, guys. Your next question will come from Brad Sills of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Oh, great. Thanks, guys, so much for, uh, for taking the question. Um, and congratulations on a nice, a nice finish to the year. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the comments made earlier, Peter, on, you know, core CRM, um, you know, only 20% penetrated in the, in the overall commercial uh, potential. Um, you know, are there certain products or offerings that perhaps are, you know, further out when you think about, you know, getting to 100% over time? I, near term, obviously, Engage is doing well. There's still some wins that you're, you're – uh, you're, you're uh, executing on, uh, you know, new customer wins. But when we look further out, maybe, you know, two, three years from now, maybe something that's on the roadmap that we might not be thinking about that, you know, you think could be could have real upside. Uh, thanks, Brad. Yeah, in terms of my, my comments there about the, the 20% of the opportunity, I'm really referring to when we sell our complete commercial products that we have today, not, not talking about uh, future products, but – products that we have today in the U.S. market, when we sell that to a small biotech, when they go all in with, all in with us, the core CRM is about 20% of the opportunity today. So the, the other 80% of that opportunity comes from the breadth of our products. Some of it is from the commercial content. There's a pretty good size chunk from Data Cloud, and that, that chunk will grow. The Crossix is a, is a sizable area. Uh, that will grow. And then we have the CRM add-ons, and we also have Nitro. So when we look for this complete commercial, which we have today in certain markets, like in the U.S., now it's in it's very early days, but we have it, that's where the opportunity comes from. So we've come a really long way from the days where, where you know, we just had CRM. Now we have a, a long tail with the data and analytics products being the, the largest areas. That's great. Thanks, Peter. And then one, one more, if I may, please, just on the uh, outside life sciences opportunity. Um, you know, $30 million of revenue is, is a nice uh, nice milestone here. Um, where are you today? I know that you, you haven't really been um, investing aggressively, kind of, you know, letting the product sell itself and at some point, um, you know, perhaps uh, getting more um, – uh, more, more aggressively investing in that business to go after the opportunity. I guess, where are you in that reference selling approach in some of these industries that, that you're going after in consumers, consumer packaged goods, mm -hmm. chemicals, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, outside of life sciences, we're focused on the consumer packaged goods, chemicals, and also cosmetics, although cosmetics has had a, you know, a tough year here with the uh, pandemic. And in that, we're focused on the quality and the regulatory areas. So the market is of a, of a certain size, to put it in reference, it's about similar to our, our CDMS market size. And it's, a, it's what I would consider it's a relatively slow and steady mover. So we're, we're, ha we're deepening our customer engagements, but this is, these are areas that don't move too fast. 
Um, so to give the guidance on that, we, we have said before we would like to have about a hundred million dollar business there in that segment of the market uh, by 2025, and we're still on track for that. So things are going uh, according to plan there outside of life sciences. Great, thanks so much, Peter. Thank you. Your next question will come from the line of Tom Roderick of Stiefel. Please go ahead. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking my question. Peter, I, I wanted to go back to your comment on, on CDMS. I think you said six of the top seven CROs are now partnered with you on that front. And, you know, perhaps that's feeding the market uh, more at the lower end or at the emerging startup side, uh, which I'd love to hear a little bit more about. But just talk a, talk a bit, if you don't mind, about uh, how the CROs are kind of uh, building up your presence on the CDMS side and what that does mean for the other top 20s where I know that that would take a little bit more of a share shift over time against some of the entrenched competitors. Uh, would love to hear more about that. Thanks. Yeah, um, Tom, it very, I consider that very significant. Six out of the top seven CROs uh, supporting Viva in our partnership program. Every, every one of the top seven CROs except for Quintiles. And that's significant because that means that's what customers are asking for. CROs are very efficient. They, they focus on getting the work done. They don't want to lead into technology when customers aren't asking for it. So this means the customers are asking for this technology, um, and it means the CROs feel that they can be very efficient with Viva. And over time, now that takes a, a year or two to really work its way into the mid-market ecosystem, but we're very bullish on that. Um, you know, I expect us to be the leader in the clinical data mar management market um, by roughly in the 2025 time frame. It's a market that life sciences is cautious on and conservative, but we have a better product, and I'm very pleased with our early adopter success with our with our customers. So I, I couldn't be happier. We entered that market in 2016, wrote the first line of code, uh, and now we're set for leadership. So very enthused about that area. Fantastic. That, that's great progress. And, uh, Brent, not to put too fine a point on it, but I appreciate some of the details on the Engage uh, sort of customer conversion and the success you're having on that. When you guide uh, for the commercial cloud for this year, can you directionally just give us some sense as to how much of that acceleration on the organic front is being driven by Engage? And, and sort of the reason by, behind asking that is as we model out longer term, trying to think about what a more normalized commercial growth rate would be once we sort of lap the benefits of, of monetizing those engaged customers that have been free for the last year. Yeah, and, and we don't we don't break out specific products in in, in guiding and, and providing results. But but with that, you know, a little little texture, you know, as I said in my prepared remarks, what we gave you a sense of what we thought the dollar opportunity was um, that we had captured at sixty percent. Um, the the other piece of the equation is you know trying to size that. So we talked. If you think about sizing it, we talked about percentage of core CRM. So we see that orienting around about 15 percent. So if you think about um, sizing that, that's that's a, something to to consider there. Um, and the rest of our portfolio had um, outside of Engage had would have a record commercial uh, growth quarter bookings quarter. So we did have strength broadly outside of Engage. Great. Really helpful. Thank you. I'll jump back in the queue. Yep. Your next question will come from Donald Hooker of KeyBank. Please go ahead. Uh, great. Good evening. Thank you for the questions here. I um, was curious if you had any kind of take on the sort of some of the changes in the CRO space. I guess obviously the big news of ICON and PRA Health. Science is uh, potentially merging. You, you commented you were excited about your progress partnering and working with CROs. I'll throw a, a, a lob out there for you. Kind of any any thoughts on the CRO landscape from your from the Viva perspective, given that merger is out there? Yeah, there's certainly a, a large merger, and, and there's consolidation that can happen in the CRO space. So I think that's actually going to be good news for us. Um, both uh, PRA and ICON are, are customers. They have some of our products, but, but not all of our products. I think as they get together and they look for more efficiency, um, they'll, they'll probably look to Viva for, for more of our products. Now, that is a consolidation in the CRO industry, but there's also always specialized smaller CROs starting up in, in certain areas. So it's always a, there's, there's both 
startups and consolidation happening. So I don't see a macro level change in the CRO industry. Uh, interesting. Thank you. And then maybe follow-up question. Just was curious if you could update us on your Viva business consulting business. I know it's a little bit it's small and it doesn't get a lot of focus, but I just have a sense that a lot of these biopharma sponsors out there, and particularly in the clinical area, are struggling with uh, wildly changing regulatory environment, the sort of the changing, you know, types of therapies coming to market and and thinking about how to how to dovetail that with a lot of the, the new technologies companies like Viva are providing. I would I would imagine that's a nice growth area for you. Can you maybe talk about that even though it's small or you look and I, I think the business consulting is more commercial now, Grant granted, but is there opportunity to expand that into regulatory and clinical? Yeah, uh, it is a relatively small now, and it is in commercial. We will bring that into the R&D area this year. Um, and let me step back and talk about what the purpose of that. It's really business process consulting. Can we help customers optimize the business process? A lot of time that's related to our products, but it may not be always related to our, our products. And that brings um, a whole bunch of efficiency because when, as you have new technology available, your processes need to change and customers need help with that. In the clinical side and in the R&D side particularly, what you're going to have is how do they optimize processes across the functional groups, the boundaries between quality and regulatory and, and clinical operations and, and clinical data and safety. How do they optimize those boundaries given that um, new technology is available? Whereas in commercial, what you're doing is optimizing field execution within a region. How do you operate better in in France? How do you operate better in, in the U.S.? So it takes a really different flavor. When we look at Viva starting out in software, you know, now we've really grown to lots of different software, but also data and business consulting. And that's, I think, the complete package. So it's uh, very significant for Viva in, overall. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Be well. Thanks. Your next question will come from the line of Sakit Kalia of Barclay. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Hey, guys, thanks for taking my questions here. Um, maybe maybe first for you, Peter, um, you know, some interesting commentary around the data cloud. Um, sounds like it, it's not only another another option to customers, but, but actually potentially even better data, um, better quality data, that is. And so the question is, can you just talk about what enables that, that potentially better quality of data and sort of broad brushes how you envision, envision the pricing on that, on that offering down the road? Um, I guess how it's better, first of all, we, we set out with the approach to innovate. Uh, the existing approach to the life sciences data is really big, is really 20 years old, really, and it really hasn't innovated. It hasn't had that competitive uh, push to innovate. So, so we are taking a different approach to data sourcing. I won't get into the specifics of that, but definitely a different approach to, to data sourcing. And then we're focusing on longitudinal data, longitudinal patient data, longitudinal pr prescriber data, and then our sales data. So. You know, if you look at it uh, historically in the past, um, the industry has gotten used to the data sets they have, but we're bringing them new new data sets with more complete coverage that can be used in, in, in better ways. So it's a very detailed work, but what we find is when data analysts get a hold of this data, they think, wow, this is the way data should be done. Now it's new, and so there's resistance to change. So it's almost like moving from client server to cloud. There's resistance to change, but uh, we're really excited about the innovation. Got it, got it. And and Brent, maybe the the follow up for you. Um, you know, I think you mentioned this when you were talking about the guide, but you you touched a little bit on on potential some potential tweaks to to sales compensation. Didn't sound like huge dollars, but curious if you could dig into kind of what those tweaks uh, are, kind of high level, and and just a recap on how that's sort of impacting the expense dollars. Yeah, certainly, Sackett. Happy to. Uh, so we're not going to get into the, the nuances of the comp plan changes, but, but broadly, you know, we're, you know, we're looking to align our goals and incentives as we do period, periodically to ensure they're aligned to customer success. And, and the changes we made enhances that alignment. 
Um, the change didn't result in any um, substantial changes to our sales OTEs, but it did result in a higher amount of P&L expense uh, in the fiscal year uh, based on the accounting treatment. Uh, so all in all, we think it's, it's been moving in the right direction to align uh, for customer success. Got it. Very helpful. Thanks, guys. Your next question will come from Joe Vruink of Baird. Please go ahead. Uh, great. Hi, everyone. Peter, I wanted to go back to your comments uh, you made at the beginning about MyViva, but more broadly, just the rise in patient-centric clinical trials. And, you know, I understand it, it's, it's a development that's still in the early innings, but if clinical practices do change and the virtual or hybrid becomes the new norm, how do you think Bolt kind of develops or evolves o over the next few years? And is it different or are there certain opportunities that maybe are, are greater if we're truly, you know, embarking on this kind of, you know, diff different way of, of clinical practices across the industry? Um, I I don't yet yeah, this whether the trials are more decentralized or or, or not um, won't really affect the, the core vault or actually the clinical network. Um, I do think, by the way, that is the approach that's going to happen: more decentralized clinical trials. But the really where we can really help is more patient-centric and more paperless clinical trials. So when you think about what we're trying to do. When, when the patient, when the doctor fills out some data after seeing the patient, whether that's virtual or, or in their office, we want them to be able to type that data into an electronic form, have that flow right back into the uh, sponsor. That's actually now not how it's done today. There's usually paper in the middle. So what we're doing is with our SiteVault product, providing software to the clinical research institutions for free so that we can automate that whole process. And uh, we're really excited about it. I guess it's the biggest undertaking that Viva has ever uh, accomplished, or, or we haven't accomplished it yet, the biggest undertaking we've ever started because we're trying to automate processes across the patient, the clinical research, and the life sciences industry. Um, that's, uh, that's quite an undertaking. That's great. And, and if I can ask one follow-up, uh, just more in regards to the near-term financial performance um, and specifically the change from kind of the initial outlook on fiscal 22 last quarter and today's communication. Other than uh, the update around commercial cloud and, and what you're seeing uh, specifically for Engage, are there any other factors that drove um, the, the uplift in, in revenue expectations? Because it is a bit larger of a change than you typically have given between the initial and you know, the, this quarter's update? Well, the good news in my answer is it's broad-based. So we've, we've seen good strength um, in demand and customer adoption across the, our development cloud suites. And as I said before, more broadly in commercial cloud outside of Engage. So it, it is really um, a broad swath of, of strength that we're seeing that drove the, the, the increase in our guide. I guess that's a, it's a slight recognition that we're becoming a more strategic partner as time goes on uh, with our customers. And that's that we feel that flows through to our business. We, we've proven ourselves more. We continue to prove ourselves more every quarter and our product print grows broader and we're bringing in more senior executives into the company. So that all those things will lead to broad-based uh, business improvement. Thank you very much. Our next question will come from Sterling Audi of J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Hi, guys. I'm kind of curious if you could give us maybe uh, a bit of a descriptive update on the the mix of the vault revenue. And what I mean by that, maybe how much of that total vault revenue is coming from clinical? I know there's a number of products versus just in pure R&D versus commercial, just all the different areas. How would you kind of split it up and describe the breakdown of vault revenue today. Yeah, hi Sterling, it's Brent. So we, we don't break down 
um, the, the vault revenue into major segments or at the product level. I think we've talked about the market opportunities um, in regarding the TAM. So we've broken that $6 billion down and, and we have a long runway across all of those segments, so across the clinical suite, regulatory, safety, and quality. Uh, there's a lot of headroom in front of us uh, and, and we're really pleased with the traction we're getting. No, okay, and say, then, what, you know, not certainly not to break it down into specific numbers, but the the largest revenue contributors in the vault families are the commercial content. Now that was the first place we we got into clinical operations and the quality. Those are the those are the three largest. Uh, regulatory is good as as well, but not quite as large. It has a a longer tail on it. And then the newer ones are the clinical data management and especially the safety. Those are. Those are very, very new. So that's that's roughly how to think of it. Great, that that's very helpful. And then the one follow up would be when you look at the business outside of life sciences, when you think about you know your longer term aspirations there, um, you know, is it all expected to be in that kind of safety and quality area, or how much of the opportunity might come from other additional uh, solutions that you might be contemplating? Well, at this time, when we talk about the $100 million, that that's really in the quality and regulatory area. Um, that's what we have visibility into now and, and we're executing on. Of course, there's always potential that we would they would do other things, but at this time, we have uh, no plans. We're not executing on, on anything other than quality and regulatory outside of uh, life sciences. Safety will be used outside of life sciences, but that's that's very early and, and that's not, and none of that is contemplated in the 100 million. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Your next question will come from Von Suri of William Blair. Please go ahead. Hey guys, this is uh, this is Dylan on for Bavon. Appreciate you uh, taking our questions, and, and we'll echo um, the, the congrats on a solid quarter. Um, I guess a first first question for me, maybe maybe more towards Peter. Um, now we, we this is a couple quarters in from that initial CRO announcement. We added another kind of top CRO in CDMS, um, but how should we maybe be thinking of these partnerships as not only drivers of the overall um, CDS adoption? I think you just kind of mentioned it on another. Uh, earlier question as well, but the overall opportunity um, for for these sponsors and CROs to expand their their adoption across the clinical suite, um, maybe as broader kind of platform integration uh, becomes more and more of a focal point um, on the on the clinical side. Yeah, I think it, it's right to focus in on that. The six of seven, uh, the top CROs. What it really indicates is you know Viva is becoming a uh, the core part of the fabric in the clinical data management area for life sciences, this integration with the service partners, the, the CROs is driven by interest from sponsors, large and, and small. Um, so we we couldn't be more excited about it, uh, I tell you. And I think we'll innovate also with these CROs, right? When they see our type of technology, it will end up causing them to change their processes to further optimize, and that's something that's going to help the industry overall. You have to remember that the existing products, the existing clinical data management products, the foundation of the two major players, those foundations were made roughly 20 years ago. And they're still, for example, not even those major players are not true cloud applications. They're not upgraded automatically. They're not all on the same release. There's a lot of inefficiencies built into the system that we're kind of a, Viva, I would say, is a breath of, of fresh air uh, for the clinical data management area. Right. No, that, that's fantastic. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially uh, w within the rest of kind of the clinical suite um, being integrated as well there. Maybe uh, one more, if I may, for uh, maybe more for Paul. Um, but just kind of maybe given the uptake, and it sounds like you guys are kind of investing in maybe the, the physician's world business with, with virtual webinars, online events, things like that. Um, just wanted to get a sense of maybe how you're positioning um, this business to take uh, or to capitalize on that opportunity, because I think maybe it was, it was more of a checkbox initially when you acquired them. It seems like there's, there's a, a, a growing and sizable opportunity there um, around kind of generating insights. Um, 
that was maybe maybe uh, greater than what you had initially expected when you acquired them uh, 12 or 18 months back. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's exactly that's exactly what's happening. Is you know it was the the, the smaller part of the business when we acquired them, and um, we we've quickly uh, pivoted the business uh, since a lot of the physical events have been uh, pretty much shut down. And some markets are still happening; they're not haven't gone to zero, but they they've, they've gone down pretty considerably. And what is growing um, very consistently across most markets are now digital events. Um, and they're growing for good reason, not only because of the pandemic, but also beyond that. You, you think about the, the reach that you can get with a digital event where geography no longer is a, is a barrier. Uh, compliance is a little bit easier. The, the overall cost and spend on the event is less because it's, you're not bringing people together physically at, let's say, a, a hotel or, or a restaurant. So there, there are a lot of reasons that, uh, that the industry has moved to more digital events, and we pivoted the business to focus on that. Uh, and that has, we're already starting to see some of the impact uh, from, from doing that, and I think that will continue over the next couple of years. Uh, so the, the, when I think about the prospects in the event space, uh, it's actually broadened our portfolio. We, we can now handle companies that do physical, that do virtual, and what I think we'll see a mix of in the future is this concept of a hybrid event where they do some, some, some parts are, some people are at a physical location and others are joining uh, virtually. Uh, so it's really uh, it's strengthened their overall uh, position in that space. That's great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you taking the questions, and congrats again. Our next question will come from Rishi Jaluria of DA Davidson. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for taking my questions. Uh, nice to see uh, continued strong momentum in, in the business. Wanted to uh, maybe go back first to the impressive CDMS traction uh, that you're seeing. Well, I was wondering if you'd give us a little bit more color, especially uh, on, on the CRO traction that you're seeing. Um, is this, you know, are, are these mostly displacing other solutions? Is it Greenfield and then going after kind of a, a bunch of different different point solutions that are stitched together? Uh, any color you can give on, on where you're seeing that traction and what, what those the customers were using in the first place would be helpful, and then I've got a follow-up. Sorry, yeah, I was on mute and you couldn't hear me. Uh, <clears throat> we're always displacing something. Now, it's it's often not a it's not a wholesale displacement. It'll start with a study at a time, and generally, um, we will be displacing one of the, the top two large players. There, um, they they have most of the market. There are smaller, very regional players or localized players. That's not where we play too much. So we'll be uh, replacing the the top two. And as to why, it's um, to better EDC. So the study builds are faster. It's a more agile development environment. Um, and that's, that's a huge reason. And then the review, the basic of the data review process is a bit more you know, streamlined. And it's true cloud, so it's always, always upgraded. And then we have a very good CDM, CTMS product and ETMF product. And especially many of those CROs have our ETMF product, and now increasingly some have our CTMS product. So they're looking at getting the whole suite from Viva. That way they don't have to maintain these troublesome integrations. They can have a smooth, smooth process flow because the CROs are all about efficiency, and you know, they can get more efficient. It's the same reason why people get a suite of applications from SAP. When things are pre-integrated together, it's more efficient. Got it. That, that's really helpful. Uh, and then I wanted to uh, get maybe a little bit more color on, on the subscription net retention rate. Um, I mean, really impressive to see it uh, actually tick up and, and looks like it's at the highest level since FY17. I was wondering if you give a little bit of color on, on what drove that improvement uh, from, from last year and, and, and actually the prior couple of years and, and maybe how we should be thinking about that metric going forward. Thanks. Yeah, let me give you just a, a qualitative uh, view on that. Uh, you know, the, the last year has been, been pretty remarkable from the standpoint of our customers have been put under significant pressure on the, both on the, the, the development side, but also on the commercial side of the business. They've been uh, forced to, to change and, and, and think differently about how they're operating. And, uh, you know, we've been in the good position where we've established a foundation with most of these companies and we've, we've helped them uh, operate efficiently, maintain business continuity, operate more digitally, operate more virtually when 
you know, when doctor's offices were closing down, when uh, clinical research sites were closing down, we were there. So, um, you know, that, that, uh, I think that's showing up in the retention numbers that you're seeing. We are viewed as that, as even a more strategic partner. It's, it's created uh, opportunity for us to, to shine even beyond, um, you know, the, the, last, uh, the last couple of years. Uh, so, it, you know, in, in these challenging times, it's there, you know, companies need, need, need a, a partner that can, you know, ex execute consistently. And, um, and I think that's part of what you're seeing in that higher retention rate. I think the, the, the one last thing I'll add is the broader vision that we talk about in each area, commercial cloud and development cloud, about bringing all of these process areas together. The companies are buying broadly into a development cloud vision. And then what the decisions they make after that become really easy. It's really a, a matter of how do they get to that? How do they grow into that development cloud over time? So it becomes more of a road mapping exercise than a vendor selection exercise. Great, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Brent Braislin of Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Maybe we'll start with Brent and finish with Peter here. Brent, a uh, vault subscription in our model is now actually larger than commercial uh, for the first time, and, and not only is this now the, the largest product, but also saw accelerating growth. So as you just think about the demand drivers that, that drove this acceleration in vault this quarter, uh, you talked about broad base, but, but was there uh, any other factors that, that drove strength in vault? And again, one quick follow-up for Peter. Yeah, and we saw, you know, as, as people, you know, adopt in, in, in products like ETMF and they look broad, more broadly across the clinical suite, you're seeing that, that just further adoption. So buying into the, the integrated um, vault platform. So a lot of strength, and it, it is truly broad-based. We saw strength in... Um, CTMS, we saw strength in our quality suite and uh, QMS as well. Um, and so it's, it's really an exciting time with broad uh, adoption across our product set. So customers are starting to go more all in, uh, in in the vault space. Got it. So it sounds like there's a little faster uptake of some of the add-ons there. I know there's, I think, 17, 18 <laughs> vault products. So good to hear. I guess, Peter, for you, um, I wanted to follow up on, on the commentary you made around biotechs. Um, you, you talked about seeing some biotechs have increasing interest in kind of going all in on Viva. My question is, what's the, the biggest benefit to the biotech? I mean, why are they coming to you saying we want to go digital first? Uh, is it just faster time to market? Is that the primary benefit that the biotechs want? Is it just a more efficient digital internal process, help me understand why you're seeing that, you know, at the biotech level, and could this be a precursor to other firms wanting to go kind of all in and, and have a digital first focus as well? Thanks. I, you know, why, so the concept of the biotech, so the biotech, they will be developing their drugs for many years and using, you know, many, many millions of dollars to go through the clinical trials, and then they, they have to commercialize, and that's a very, very critical time. It's a make-or-break time for, for the company. So that's the context when they, some of them coming to us in the commercial cloud and wanting to go broadly in with even Now, why, why do they want that? A, they need somebody they can trust. Uh, they know digital is really important and they need a, a partner they can really trust. They've learned to trust Viva. Many of them have been using us on the R&D side. Um, and they have to do it right digitally. And so they, this is kind of new, right? They, it's not the same old way to do it. So they're looking for a company that can put it all together for them. And I think uh, our business consulting is critical in this. In fact, when they go all in with us, uh, business consulting is basically a required part of that package because you can't do that just with technology. You need the business process work to make the technology to make that technology work work for you. So it's critical for the biotech, and they trust us, and we have the complete package. That's that's why they would come to us. Otherwise, they have to be the general contractor. They might buy data from here and software from here and digital from there and content from here and, and get consulting from another place. That's um, more areas that could fall down if the company themselves has to be the general contractor. So, hey, how, how do you do that for us? 
certainly helpful and, and uh, explains uh, why we're seeing a certainly a big uptick in number of uh, job openings on the consulting side. Thank you so much. Thank you. Your next question will come from Kirk Matern of Epicor ISI. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Peter, you're obviously spending a lot of time with your customers talking through their own digital journey from a sales perspective. I was kind of curious about how you're thinking about your own go-to-market operations, you know, not only you know in the coming year, but uh, how are you thinking about making some changes? And then you know, hopefully when people can start getting on planes you know, over the next few months or six months, you know, are there any products that you think will be helped out by the fact that you can have people on site talking to your customers in person again? Or have you gotten to the point where you all can sell pretty much the whole, whole portfolio you know, virtually at a pretty effective level? I, I'm thinking about things like data where these are big transformations that maybe having those conversations in person might, might be helpful. So can you walk through kind of anything you're changing this year and then, then anything that might be helped out maybe uh, by, by moving past COVID? Thanks. Um, not a, what we're changing this year is our, our summits. We have our customer summits. Those are always a key part of, of Viva. We get the customers together. Um, we would always do those in person, two-day events. Last year, we had to pivot very quickly to do those online, and they went well, but I think we can do better. So this year, we're looking at doing our virtual events even better. We're going to try out some new formats that we're really excited about. So that's that's one thing. And have, have the marketing and the customer engagement a little more continual. You know, we've got to remember last year, we had to pivot so hard on our product model, our product uh, roadmap and to support our customers and all their twists and turns. So we were sort of hair on fire. This year we're at a steady state, I think, with COVID, and so we're going to optimize um, some of our marketing and sales processes. Now, in terms of getting back together, I don't think that will impact any one product more than any other product, uh, but I do think that in-person interaction generally does help the speed of business. I think overall business will be a little more effective ineffective over time if we if we don't get back together. Um, now that won't just affect Viva, I just think overall that personal connection is needed. It provides people with energy and ideas and travel has a way of shaking you out of your norm. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. How about that? We're, you know, we're gonna yeah. travel when we can, we're gonna get out there because you get used to just being, not having that interaction and something is missed. So the whole, Viva team is, and, and our customers. They're, we're looking to get back together again. That sounds great. Congrats on a nice year. Thank you. Thank you. And we have time for one final question from Stan Slusky of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, guys, uh, for taking my question, and congratulations on a very strong, strong quarter. Um, I actually wanted to come back to net revenue retention for a second uh, because, I mean, that, that was um, – uh, that was certainly a, a, an impressive result. Um, maybe help us unpack it a little bit. Um, and you know, how much of the of the uptick that we saw in net revenue retention to 124 percent in uh, fiscal 21 was due to the you know quote, quote, quote unquote like inorganic or maybe one time contribution from uh, selling the the CrossX product into the install base. Or maybe even the, the engaged product. Obviously, that's completely organic, made by you. But um, it was it was obviously a disproportionate benefit uh, this year as well. Um, how much of that was a driver of the uptick uh, versus what's you know really sustainable, uh, you know, going forward into fiscal 22 and beyond? Hey, Stan, it's Brent. So um, clearly, Engage what did contribute to that. But what I would say is development cloud more broadly also was a big driver of, of that uptick as we continue to, you know, land and expand our, our, our offerings across our customer base. So it was um, more than just a one-time pop. There, there was some substantial, um, uh, of, uh, you know, attach and cross-selling that happened in, in the uh, development cloud space that, that helped drive that number. Got it. Um, that's helpful. And just maybe taking um, a slightly uh, a slightly reverse uh, way to ask the question about the pharmaceutical headcount reductions. In um, as much as in Q3 you guys were talking to us about 
potential for a, a 10 percent ish type of uh, decline in global headcount uh, in 2021. What happens if, if that decline is not 10 percent, right? I mean, what's baked into your uh, billings guidance for fiscal 22? You know, what happens to when you, what kind of renewal base do you have baked in there? And is, are you truly baking in 10 percent or is it something uh, less than the 10 percent of the reductions that we're talking about in Q3? Thank you. Yeah, so we, we in fact, are baking uh, those reductions in, and, uh, you know, we bake them in over time because we, we, don't, we don't see this as an abrupt change. We see it as a gradual change that will happen over time. It will happen, um, we believe, over the next one to two years. Now, the impact on, on our financials will be somewhat muted because that will happen over a period of time. It, even a change that happens uh, this fiscal year may not hit us until the next fiscal year. Um, and, I, and I think a lot of that will be offset by uh, strength that we're going to continue to have. We're anticipating having in CRM and in the, the add-ons and the broader commercial cloud portfolio. So, uh, so we have, in fact, uh, baked those reductions in. But again, most of, most of what you see there is offset by, uh, by some of the core uh, commercial cloud strength. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And we have no further questions. I'll turn the call back over to the presenters for any closing remarks. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your time. And we are looking forward to talking with many of you at the Morgan Stanley Conference tomorrow. And we're also looking forward to a great year ahead. Thank you. And this concludes today's conference call. Thank you very much for joining. You may now disconnect. <laughs>